Hey, welcome back to Computer Science Theory. This is comms, W3261, offered summer 21, summer 2021 at Columbia University. And this is lecture nine, part two. Variant Turing Machine. So over the last couple of lectures, we've been talking about this new automaton called the Turing machine, and we've mentioned the fact that it's really powerful. Um, in this next part, I'm going to be showing you several variants on the Turing machine. Generally, each of these examples are going to go like, we give the Turing machine some superpower. We say, suppose it has an extra gadget attached. Um, and certainly that gadget can't possibly hurt the execution, it'll pretty much help and then we will prove some theorem or sketch some theorem that demonstrates, well, actually, the gadget doesn't give the Turing machine any more power. So, in fact, we can assume without loss of generality, anything solved by one of these variant Turing machines decided or recognized can be decided or recognized by a normal Turing machine. So, let's get into it. Let's see some of these. The first variant Turing machine we'll consider is a multi-tape turning machine. So in picture form, we're used to a turning machine that looks like this. That is, it has a head that points at the input tape and moves left and right. Uh, the multi-tape turning machine is just like the first one, but in addition to the input tape, we also have additional work tapes. Which start out empty, and then we can mess with them. We can record things on them. So we can store memory on these tapes as well as on our work tapes. So, formally, uh, the multi-tape TM is going to be defined just the same as a regular Turing machine, except the transition function will be a little different. The transition function will tell us what to do on all the tapes with all the tape heads at the same time. The multi-tape Turing machine is a seven-tuple like the TM, but with the transition function. As follows, so our new transition function for the multi-tape turning machine is going to map from a state and K different tape symbols. So it should make sense that we have an input, which is one state, that's the current state of the state control, plus k different tape symbols, because our Turing machine can read in a tape symbol from each of the k tapes. I'll say, I'll specify that we have k additional work tapes for some finite k. And we'll map to, well, a new state, k new things that we write on the tape. and also K head movement, because each of these heads can move left or right independently. And the S symbol will stand for stay put, don't move left or right. Uh, previously, we just had left or right symbols because of the simple definition, but it turns out that adding the stay put symbol to keep a head in the same place uh, doesn't actually add any generality. Of course, if we wanted to stay put with a regular Turing machine, we could add two instructions to move right and then back to the left without doing anything to the tape. So the stay put symbol doesn't actually help us. The real difference here is that we're moving all K of the heads off 
equally in different directions all at the same time. So an example of this transition function might be something like um, the transition from state QI. If we see the symbols A1, A2, dot, 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 all the way to AK on the tape, might be go to state QJ, write the symbols B1, B2, through BK on the tape, and then finally move the first head left, the second head right, third head right, the fourth head don't move, and specify that for all K symbols. Um, and the surprise here, so clearly a multi-tape Turing machine is going to be at least as powerful as a regular Turing machine. Um, we can use it just as a regular Turing machine by reading in the input tape and never moving any of the heads on the additional work tapes. But surprisingly, it's no more powerful than uh, a normal Turing machine. Adding multiple tapes doesn't give us uh, a better ability to recognize or decide languages. So we'll sketch the following theorem. And the theorem says every multi-tape Turing machine has an equivalent single-tape Turing machine. Um, And how we'll prove this, well, we want to show that given some multi-tape Turing machine, we can build a single-tape Turing machine that does exactly the same thing, uh, that accepts or rejects or loops, if and only if our multi-tape Turing machine does that. So the idea, we will simulate all K tapes of a given K tape Turing machine on one tape. So we'll do a high level description of a new machine M. So M will do the following. One, it will start by writing down uh, delimiters for the contents of K tapes onto the one work tape. So on an input, W1, W2, dot, 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 WN, um, what our machine is going to do is it's going to rewrite its work tape so it looks like the following. Um, we'll write down a special symbol to denote the first tape, which I'll write down as a one with a circle over it. We'll write down W1, W2, W3, WN. So that'll be our input tape. And then we'll write down special symbols to mark the beginning of all of these other tapes that we're going to simulate. So I'll just annotate this. This marks the beginning of our simulated tapes. So um, what that'll let us do is um, modify each tape individually as if it was a separate tape. Um, what we're also going to do is we're going to mark the position of each tape head with a dot. So of course, um, did an extra dot by accident. So these dots will represent Tape heads. So 
of course, we only have one case head in our new single tape Turing machine, but that's not really a problem. We can keep track of all K-tape heads just by moving these marks around. So now we have essentially written down the state of a multi-tape Turing machine. We've written down K-tapes and we've written down where each head is. So step two, mark virtual tape heads. We showed that. And step three is just simulate the transition function. Or the K tape Turing machine. Um, one thing that could possibly happen, so you know, it's no problem to simulate the transition function. We just read this transition function and we move each head and rewrite tape squares just as the transition function tells us to. Uh, the only real issue will be if we run out of space. on a virtual tape. So of course, our virtual tapes are limited in space because we can't have an unlimited uh, extension of blanks from each one. We just run a special subroutine to add those blanks. So what this will look like at the implementation level, essentially before we uh, move each tape head, we'll check to see if it's moving off the end of the virtual tape. And if it is, we'll pause our simulation and we'll run a special subroutine to add a new blank or a new symbol to the end of our virtual tape. And then we'll continue our execution. Um, and then finally, we accept or reject when the simulation accepts or rejects. And of course, if our simulation loops forever, that's exactly what the original machine did. So our Turing machine will be equivalent. So we have now proven, or we've at least sketched at a high level, a Turing machine that simulates the K-tapes of a given K-tape Turing machine. And the takeaway here is that since multiple tapes don't give us any more power, since they decide and recognize the exact same set of languages as regular tape TMs, that means to show something is Turing recognizable. or decidable, we can assume multiple states without loss of generality. So that's handy. That's another superpower that will make our Turing machine definitions easier. And that is the multi-tape Turing machine. What other superpowers can we give to our Turing machine? Well, there's one computational superpower that we've talked about over and over. Uh, it's been part of our previous automata. Natural to wonder, can we have a non-deterministic Turing machine? Of course we can. So previously, the Turing machines we've defined have been completely deterministic. Every uh, state and tape symbol has told us to do exactly one thing, go to a new state, move the tape head, write down a new symbol, or I should say, go to a new state, write down a new symbol, and then move the tape head. Um, so why not add non-determinism? Why not imagine that we're guessing computations or making multiple copies of our machine or whatever, um, Whatever image best suits this computational abstraction for you. 
So we can absolutely do this. This will require a new transition function. All the other formal details are the same. And this looks just like our other non-deterministic transition function in that uh, the domain is exactly the same. We have a single state that we're in and something we read off the tape. So state, state symbol. But instead of transitioning to one single state, we allow transition to many states or to no states. Our branches of computation can die. Um, so we'll use the power set again. We'll say if we transition to one new configuration, that'll require a new state, something to write on the tape and the left to right movement. We'll consider the power set of all possible triples that fit that form. So set of new configuration we go to. And of course, now we accept if any branch accepts. So that's similar to other times we've implemented non-determinism. So non-determinism um, might be unclear in DFA world with finite automata, uh, non-determinism didn't actually give us any extra power. We showed that by taking the power set of the set of states in NFA and turning them into DFA states, we could turn any NFA into a DFA. We didn't talk about it, but with pushdown automata, that's actually not true. The pushdown automata that we looked at that were non-deterministic actually are different from deterministic pushdown automata. Um, with Turing machines, it's going to turn out that non-determinism doesn't increase the set of languages we can recognize or decide. In particular, we can prove the following theorem. We can prove that every non-deterministic Turing machine has an equivalent deterministic Turing machine. And here's a proof idea. I'll call it a proof sketch. So how do we prove this? Again, we imagine we have some non-deterministic Turing machine. We want to build an equivalent deterministic Turing machine. So the idea here is that non-deterministic computation looks like a decision tree. So we've drawn this picture of computation before. If this is the start configuration, then we might take multiple edges to go to the next configuration. And you know, from here, we might have multiple transitions as well. Some of our branches might die. Some of them might reject. So we'll end up with some tree um, of rejections, accepts, branches that die. And in principle, we can traverse this tree. Like if you give me any one configuration, like the start configuration, Q0W, where Q0 is the start state and W is the input string, I can enumerate every possible first edge that I can take. Um, that is every possible first transition I can make according to my transition function, which gives me the set of states I can go to. So we can traverse this tree. In particular, we can use a deterministic Turing machine to traverse all branches of this tree according to breadth first search
So we will look at the top node of the tree, we'll look at the first and second level of the tree, and we'll look at the third level of the tree, and so on and so forth. Um, but we eventually find any branch that reaches an accept state. Except, in this case, reject if we finish exploring the tree. And then what happens in a looping case? Well, if our non-deterministic computation goes on indefinitely, uh, that happens precisely when some branch keeps going on indefinitely, and that will mean our simulation will go on indefinitely. Similarly, if our simulation goes on indefinitely, then that must mean that every time we traverse a finite number of levels of the tree, some branch isn't finished computing. So a question you might reasonably ask here on the side is why not step first search? I'll write it out in case you're looking at these notes later. And the answer is infinite loops. In particular, it's possible that some branch of a non-deterministic computation never terminates, but another branch accepts, in which case the non-deterministic computation accepts. If we did a depth first search, we might go you know, we might get stuck going down that infinite branch and never find our accept branch. However, if we do a breadth first search, that means the depth we search to is continually increasing, so we won't get stuck in the infinite loop trap, and every accept state, which occurs at a finite depth, we'll get to eventually. So, um, to give this Turing machine in a little more detail, so we'll define a Turing machine D to do this with three tapes. And of course, we can assume three tapes without lots of generality. We've just proven that anything we can do with a multi tape Turing machine, we can do with a regular Turing machine. Um, we'll have an input tape which stores the input. and does not change. An address tape, which stores our position in the tree of possible computations. That is, we need to know which node of this tree on the right we are currently inhabiting at an intermediate point in computation. Sorry. Notability crashes on me from time to time. I'm not sure why. Let's just rewrite that really quick. We'll define a Turing machine to do this with three tapes. Uh, we have an input tape which remains unchanged. It just stores our input for reference. An address tape that stores our position on the tree. And we have um, we have a work tape which keeps track of our current computation. Every time we change the address, we um, copy a fresh input 
onto the work tape. And simulate to this point. So in other words, suppose I'm at this node, which is child two and then child two. So I could call this address two, two if I wanted to, it doesn't really matter. There's many equivalent ways of storing the address, but we'll imagine our Turing machine has this address written down. And suppose I wanted to go from there and traverse down to two, two, one. Uh, I would copy a fresh copy of the input onto the work tape, and then I would simulate a new computation, taking decision two followed by decision two followed by decision one of the listed transition. And that would get me to a computation in that relevant state on the work tape. That's just a little bit of detail on how this general high-level sketch works. All of these proofs, by the way, if you wanted to classify them in terms of our definition, formal, formal um, implementation details, uh, implementation level explanations, and high-level explanations, they would all be high-level explanations because I'm not really talking about how the tape head would move around or how memory is managed. The takeaway here. Since we can simulate a non-deterministic Turing machine with a deterministic Turing machine, to prove languages are Turing recognizable or decidable, we can assume non-determinism without loss of generality. So now that I've given you these two proofs, if you want to show something is Turing recognizable, you can say, give me a 10 tape non-deterministic Turing machine, and we can generically boil it down to a regular one tape deterministic Turing machine. So that's handy. And we're starting to get the intuition that we'll build on later that Turing machines can kind of do anything that any machine we can reasonably define does. With the exception of certain really massive powers, like action to an oracle, which is a real thing later on in theory of computer science, Turing machines can just about do it all. Well, they can't do everything, but they can do everything that can be reasonably done. Our final superpower, a little bit different because this one doesn't actually aid computation, it's just an additional function we can add to a Turing machine is enumerators or enumeration. So the idea here is give a Turing machine a printer that can write down strings. So I think the picture in Sipser is kind of cute. They draw a picture of a state control with a tape head scanning left to right on an input string. This is just a regular Turing machine. And then they show a wire connected to a little box with lights on it that is Spooling out a sheet of paper with things written on it. I think this is a good picture of, well, it's not a good drawing, but it's a good idea of how an enumerator works. So what does an enumerator do? It's just a Turing machine, except at any given point, it can write down um, the string that is currently on its work tape, which is specified from the work tape. So we can show 
that a language is Turing recognizable if and only if some enumerator enumerates it. That is, writes down all strings in the language. And of course, we can enumerate infinite languages, which means enumeration can be an infinite process. So we can define a procedure that will eventually write down all strings of zeros, write down zero, then zero, zero, then zero, 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 and so on. That's still a valid enumeration because it eventually gets to every string in the language, even though it's also an infinite process. So to prove this fact, what we'll have to do is we'll have to show that if a language is recognized by some Turing machine, we can come up with an enumerator to enumerate it. Also, if we have some enumerator enumerating a language, we can show how to create a Turing machine that recognizes it. So both directions of the if and only if. So um, the forward direction, the terrible arrow, forward direction of this proof looks like this. Suppose some enumerator E recognizes, enumerates a language. We define the following Turing machine. that recognizes M, M, L. Uh, and it works like this. M is the name of our Turing machine. On an input, W, our Turing machine will do the following. We will simulate the behavior of the enumerator. Every time the enumerator output the string, we compare the string with W. On a match, we accept. So why does this work? Well, we can certainly write down a representation of E on our work case, and we can simulate its function. Our new Turing machine can't actually output a string, but it can get to the point of E's computation where E outputs a string. And every time it does that, it will write down that string and check it against the input string W. So clearly, if E, um, if W is in the language, E will eventually enumerate it and M will recognize it because it will eventually compare it to something enumerated by E. Uh, to go the other direction, we have to show that we can create an enumerator to enumerate a language for every string in the language, every string recognized by some Turing machine. And this is where we're going to see um, one of our first, maybe the first time in a proof that we've said, write down all the strings in a language. But we can do that. So we'll show, suppose, a Turing machine, M, recognizes a language L. We show an enumerator, E, that enumerates L. So we will let uh, S1, S2, S3, dot, 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 this is an infinite sequence, 
be an infinite sequence. containing all strings over sigma, the alphabet, input alphabet of M. All right, so this might seem like a crazy object to posit, but it's really not that crazy. For instance, if sigma was the binary alphabet, then we could say, okay, well, F1 is zero, F2 is one, and then S3, S4, S5, well, that's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. And you could certainly define a way to enumerate all the strings. That's not a hard thing to do. The tricky bit is enumerating just the ones that M recognizes. But now, E is defined as follows. On make it a for loop. We'll say for i equals one, two, three, and that'll be an infinite for loop stretching on to infinity. We will simulate m for i steps, i steps of computation on strings s1, s2, all the way to si. If any computation accepts, print that string. So why does this work? Well, now suppose some string SJ is in the language of M. And we'll say M takes K steps to accept SJ. Now, when the loop reaches the iteration max of J and K, that is, whichever one is larger, J or K, um, we'll run for that many steps on strings up to, say it's J, so J is larger, then we'll run J steps on strings up to SJ. Uh, we'll accept when we simulate M on SJ, and we will enumerate it. In other words, for every string in the language, this particular en enumerator will eventually reach that string and will eventually simulate M for enough steps on that string to accept it and print it. That's our argument that E will enumerate precisely the strings in the language L. So, note here, we simulate I strings or I steps to avoid infinite loops. So in other words, if I said simulate M on S1 until M stops, and then simulate M on S2 until M stops, that wouldn't work necessarily because M might run forever on one of those inputs. Similarly, if I said, um, run for any finite number of steps on all the strings, well, there's an infinite number of strings. So I can do this neat dovetailing thing of running M for I steps on I strings to ensure that eventually I will recognize and enumerate every string that M recognizes. So that is our proof that um, the language is turning recognizable if and only if some enumerator enumerates it. And this gives us a historical note, or I guess you could just say it's a, um, a naming note. 
So the Turing recognizable languages are sometimes called the recursively enumerable languages because of this equivalence. So because the Turing recognizable languages are precisely those that can be enumerated, sometimes we call them recursively enumerable and the class is often abbreviated RE. So in other words, uh, if you ever see someone claim, hey, this language is in RE, you know that what they really mean is that it's Turing recognizable. For instance, there was a famous result last year. Somebody proved, well, several people proved that MIP equals RE, and um, I hope I'm not going to mess this up, means the class of all languages that can be recognized by multiple entangled interactive quantum provers is the same as all the recursively enumerable languages. Um, there might be some details on how many steps they're allowed to use or precisely how they're configured, but of course, you can look up the paper by this name if you're interested. Uh, that takes us to the end. Uh, our variant Turing machine fit. So next up, we will show how to go from Turing machines, that is high level descriptions of Turing machines, to sort of general purpose algorithms. In other words, the trend where we take formal definitions and make them less formal and less formal and less formal and talk in more general terms about what our Turing machines can do because they can do almost anything, that trend is going to accelerate dramatically. So I'll see you in that next part. Thanks for watching. Bye.